Hi, Peter Boyles. Welcome back to The Shoot. Of course, 9 to noon every Saturday morning, I do the live show here on 710 KNUS. We're right down the hall. And this began with a project with Mark Crowley and myself many months ago. And we dubbed it The Shoot, stealing from, from starting to say that, from professional wrestling. There are real things and then there are works, but the shoots are the real ones. And we've been through a series of people who have been tremendous to me and people that I really love and respect. One of them is the Sheriff of Weld County. I think, I'll tell you, he's the man, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Steve Reeves. Um, thank you, sir. It's a snowy day in Denver and you came in to do the show and thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure, Pete. It's always a good time to have a conversation. We ride motorcycles together. We have big talks about politics together. He's been a spirit guide on so many things. And actually when the book is written, there'll be a story to be told about what the sheriff did for my family. And sure. it's, um, no. uh, being a cop today and being a sheriff today, and there's a, there's sh plates of the earth have shifted. Spurlock's out. Sheriff Schrader's out. Yep. You're on term limits. Yep. Um, talk to that. Well, yeah, I'm in my third, <coughs> third and final term. Um, I feel like I'm kind of the last bastion of, uh, of conservatism in the state of Colorado. You know, Jeff and Tony came in at the same time I did. They were two terms. I, I, I got a third. Uh, but the conservative movement in the state of Colorado seems, seems to be dying, as we've talked about mm -hmm. with a lot of election cycles. Uh, I'm pretty fortunate to be in a very conservative county. Um, I get to be a sheriff the way I think a sheriff should be. But when you talk about those shifts, it's not just in those conservative values, but it's in the, the <laughs> legislature of this state. I mean, what I, what I thought was being a cop when I started and what's being a cop now is I mean, it's vastly different. Uh, elaborate. How many years has it been and what's changed? Yeah. So I started in 1997, so that I just finished my 25th year. Um, you know, when I came into law enforcement, it was all about, you know, the support mm. for the cops. We were going to go out and catch the bad guys, clean up the streets. And now it seems as if, you know, it's our job to try to figure out how to mentor the bad guys out of this lifestyle and how to treat them nice and, you know, look the other way when they're, when they're addicted to drugs and all that other kind of stuff. We're supposed to be the the counselor out on the street instead of just, you know, the, the, the people that hold, uh, hold those bad folks accountable. It's not a good system. Uh, you can see what's happening in the state of Colorado. Crime's at an all-time high. Um, and at some point, you, you know, you think the voters and the legislators are going to figure it out, but it doesn't feel like that'll be the case while I'm still in law enforcement. This is the first day as we record this, the first day the legislative bodies are meeting. Yeah. This is opening day. <laughs> and I'm, I'm petrified. You know, they're, they're talking about gun control legislation in the state of Colorado, uh, going after uh, gun owners, you know, innocent people yeah. who, who want to exercise their Second Amendment right, but there's no, nothing to address, you know, fentanyl that's plaguing our streets or, or car theft. Uh, very, very little effort given to where the real problems are. No, I agree. I mean, I, I have watched, I've been here long enough to watch it stair step. Yeah, yeah. And... All the, you know, the, the men and women of law enforcement that I initially met when I got into this business, they've all retired, but the men and women of law enforcement who were influenced by those guys. Right. For instance, uh, I went to Jerry Kennedy's funeral okay. this year, and Kennedy was who he was. Sure. No getting around him. But all these old, old school cops, they're gone. Yeah, I, I feel like I'm part of the historical society. No now. question. And, and you know, I, I don't feel like I'm that old, but you start looking around and, no. and seeing the new wave of law enforcement come in. And, you know, I, I don't know if that system works or not. In fact, I, I'd say it doesn't, but um, it takes time for those, those pendulums to shift. And at some point, you have to believe the state will come back to, to what's effective. Uh, what, what we're doing right now isn't, though. We've been over this conversation, and Casper sat here, all these different people sat here, and they've said, well, we can't win, and they've almost <laughs> doomed themselves, and I don't believe that. Well, if you can't win, then then why even be engaged? Exactly. Um, you know, I, I, I argue that you can win with with any candidate if that candidate has the right message. Mm -hmm. um, you gotta ha you got to find the right person for the right seat, and uh, we haven't been very successful at doing that in Colorado. <laughs> But it doesn't mean that you can't. Um, you can find the right person. You have to. You have to be willing to support them, put the right team around them. And I don't care what office it's for. Um, but we, as a state, have not figured out how to rally as a team. What happened in this last go around? What happened to the Republican Party? We got butchered. Yeah. Um, I mean, to to put it mildly, you know, Republicans were really good at saying, "Hey, these are all the things that are broken," and they proposed themselves as the fix. Well, that's great if you believe in that person as, as the, the end-all, be-all, but instead of providing solutions, they were the solution. 
you know, vote for me and I'll fix it all. You got to come up with some some <laughs> some more meat than just your name. I use you as my example often, and I know you hear it on the air. This is a very, very, very conservative member of law enforcement. You had the fatal <laughs> error of saying Donald Trump lost. Well, he did. And we have a signal now. Rhino. <laughs> and it, it was, that's the truth. That's our new signal. He yeah. was like, this is the guy that's a rhino. You became a rhino that night. Sure. Speak to that. You know, I, I call it like it is. I, I'm not real big on dancing around things. I, I believe in uh, tackling stuff head on. And I, I watched what was happening with that election cycle when Trump got beat. And he, he made so many fatal flaws. Oh. And some of that's kind of refreshing in a way because you realize he, he wasn't a polished politician. He was doing all the things that you would expect a rookie politician to do. You know, when everybody's uh, promoting to mail in your ballot, stay home, don't go out during COVID, he's pounding the table and telling his voters, uh, you know, go, go vote in person. Well, obviously they didn't. Yeah. You know, the narrative was was against that. When Georgie told him not to, it won't be yeah. counted. Yeah, it won't be uh, counted. Yeah. So, you know, you... You kind of get what you, you you get what you deserve, and, and I thought Trump was an excellent president while he was in office, but from the time that the he, that he lost the election and until now, uh, I I don't know I don't know what happened to the guy, but um, it, it's a mess. It's a dumpster fire. I have this term called the stench of Trump. Yeah, and uh, Bobert got the scare of her life. Sure, uh, people that were on talk radio saying, "Oh, this is going to be close between and the governor's job and." They're, you know, no, yeah. they weren't. I had dinner last night with Dean Singleton. Dean had this dope. He said 20 points here, 15 points here. And he was absolutely right. I mean, these yeah. guys are out there selling wolf tickets. Yeah, you know, it's tough because I, I think you did have some quality folks that stepped up. Obviously, uh, you know, they, they wanted to run for an office. They thought they could make change in. Uh, but as a party <clears throat> in the state of Colorado, if we can't rally behind a candidate, and say, hey, this is going to be our person. Whether we like every uh, all hundred percent of that person, we're never going to have a chance. And boy, you you talked about crib deaths oh. with some of these folks. You're right. The minute that they didn't check off a particular box for mm, certain done. members of the Republican Party, they were done. done. I never met Joe O'Day in defeat. He came, sat on this seat. Sure. We sat and talked. Um, I suspect you know him. I, I, oh yeah. Yeah. Not a bad guy. No. Um, I don't know if his Hail Mary was Trump lost. I don't know what. But my contention, many of the same people, and we have looked at that in the back of the white pickup truck video outside of Republican headquarters. Those people, they're crib deaths. They strangled people at birth. Uh, yeah. O'Day was never going to get off the ground. Um, Heidi wasn't going anywhere. No, I mean, you look at how much O'Day spent, and he, his race was probably the most competitive. Yeah. Um, I, I think he was and trying to... And still, what, 14 points? Yeah, he was trying to walk a very narrow, uh, narrow pathway to try to figure out how to balance the abortion issue. Uh, ultimately, Republicans just looked at the issues wrong. We didn't, we, you know, we didn't, we didn't have a good get ground game, a good game plan, and we got our butts kicked. As simple as that. Well, do they come to you during all of this? Do you get approached? I mean, I went to a... You, you threw a get-together. I rode up mm -hmm. on my motorcycle and watched all of this happen. How often were you approached through this for your weight, for money? Um, by almost every yeah. major candidate. Um, not necessarily for money, because I don't have a lot of that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I do have a following to some degree, and so people would ask for, the, for an endorsement. And there were certain folks that, you know, I would engage with and others that I absolutely didn't want to tie my name to. And Do you mind? Yeah. Is it? Uh, you know, Heidi. I, I supported Heidi. I yeah. thought she... You threw a fundraiser. That's yeah. where I met her. Yeah, yeah. she came to my fundraiser yeah. and, uh, you know, I tried to promote her as much as I could. Uh, there were others that I just flat out didn't want to be connected with. Um, you know, Ron Hanks. Cool. I, I mean, I, I watched from the, the moment he started, I watched kind of what he did at the State House, and he's just not my brand of politics. Now, if he had been the nominee... Would I have voted for him? Probably so. I and, wonder. And, 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 you know, that's the difference between yeah, yeah, uh, some of the stuff we've yeah. talked about. Uh, I'd have laid out of it. Yeah, I, I, and yeah, I understand yeah, that. Yeah. But so would a lot of voters yeah. and, and every unaffiliated voter. Tina Peters. Uh, yeah, no way I'm touching that. Was she? Did she approach you? No, she did not. Uh, to her credit, I think she uh, she doubled down on the folks that wanted to go down the, the Trump Twenty twenty conspiracy. Have you noticed thing, she has vanished from their lips? Yeah, she's gone. Well, but we heard from her. We heard about her constantly from this same faction of people that today go Tina who? Well, you know, her name still bubbles up a little bit when you talk about the chairman's race for the GOP. Oh. 
Again, that was a that was a deciding <laughs> factor for me to say I don't want to do this. If I, I don't want well, to be I'm going to come to that. Those but if I were the if I were a Democrat, I'd be giving money to Tina to run for chairman. <laughs> Please, well, Tina, run. You know that that was the that was yeah. the strategy used against um, many of the yeah. the folks in the race. They were trying to bolster up these weaker candidates, and you know to some degree it must have worked. Tipping hand is a friendship. We had conversations about my friend Steve, not Sheriff Steve, but my friend sure. Steve, about whether or not the chairman's job was for you. Yeah. And <laughs> I can tell you what my advice was, but... Well, yeah. you know, I, I always say someone's got to do it, right? Someone's mm -hmm. got to step in. And um, I, I've been able to to unite a lot of people that had differences over a lot of issues. And, uh, you know, I, right, wrong, or indifferent, it's, it's been successful to some degree. And you start looking at, gosh, you got to start somewhere, right? Have we hit, have we hit rock bottom? And so I had several people that reached out to me and said, you ought to at least consider it. So that's exactly what I was doing is considering it. And then you start doing a little research oh. and figuring out what fundraising totals have been for the Republican Party and kind of those factions that are still existing. And hey, how do you bring those folks together? And I honestly just didn't see a pathway where that looked like there was going to be any success. They would, not, har not they would harpoon you. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I'd be the rhino because... Oh. I'm I'm not uh, I'm not out pounding the table for Trump. No, you know, if, and beyond that, I mean, there's sure. so many different issues that I call them the white pickup truck people or whomever you want to call them, fake talk radio, whatever it is. They'd have been laying in the weeds for you. <laughs> and I, I even said, I said, stay away from these people. These, you have you have a career ahead of you. You're a young man. You're term limited. Yeah, you know, I don't know that politics is something I want to pursue after being the sheriff, but. I would like to see the politics of this state turn around, uh, only because I have kids and I, I want to oh, see man. them grow up in the state that that I've been fortunate to live in for many years until the last five or six. You know, I think Colorado's treated me and my family oh. really well, but boy, I don't see a pathway for that in the next ten. Casper Stockham, who was here last week, the only guy who I think there's somebody else that announced, but he's the only guy running for chair right now. And we were sitting here, and he's he's and, and I like the man immensely, but he was doom and gloom. Uh, nobody can win. We can't win. And I've got these two names in the back of my head. Dave Logan, of course, and uh, I think sure. Peyton Manning. Yeah. Now, I, by the way, I have to say this all the time because it came back. I've never had a conversation with Dave <laughs> or Peyton about running for office. But if Dave Logan ran for governor, I could, I mean, Dave could win. Uh, you know, I, I don't disagree with you. Yeah. I think it's it's going to take the right personality. I mean, Arnold Schwarzenegger ran for governor in California. If you're Absolutely. looking for an example, that's how it works. Uh, I would have said John Elway was in that, that realm, up too. Up until? Up until the last two years. Yeah, and it was football. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you yeah. take Peyton Manning, you take Dave Logan, mm -hmm. and there's probably a handful of Ooh. other names that could probably resonate. Dan Kaplis, he's another one that I, you know, he, his name gets thrown around uh, several times over. Mm -hmm. I, think there's, I think there's a pathway to do it. But you got to find that person who's established that has credibility from all sides, and uh, you know, some, a little you bit of star power even. I mean, it, it was like, who doesn't want it? Right. And then when they make an announcement on governor, then they come up with a lieutenant governor. It seems like nobody else wanted the job. This guy who becomes a denier, then who denies he denied. Then they show the video of him denying. I mean, I'm thinking to myself, who's planning this out? Well, you know, I consider Heidi a friend, and oh, from afar, no I kept, harm, no foul. Yeah, I kept watching her race, and and yeah. I, and I was critical of her, uh, critical of her, and to her, uh, on a couple of occasions. I, you know, I think <clears throat> if you start out out of the gate and you you have a misstep, uh, from then on out, you're you're in trouble. And they had a misstep when they started out of the gate, and right down recovered. the hall, the studio. I met her the first time. Actually, I met her the first time with you, but as she sit in the studio, I said, "Did Trump win?" Yeah, tough she question. Gulped. Right? <laughs> she couldn't answer it. And I'm thinking, you can't. And, she, and then all it began with all the, you can't ask her that. I said, well, if I don't, the press is and the Democrats sure. sure as hell will. Well, and we had that discussion several times over. I told her what my thought was, and, you know, she answered the way she answered. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not about it's water Trump. under said, the bridge. Of course it yep. is. I, of course it is. Well, whatever yeah. the answer was, we lost. Hardest part about being sheriff. Oh, geez. Uh, personnel issues. Yeah. I mean, honest to God, uh, fighting crime is pretty easy, but every cop has a life and every cop is a human and, um, you know, they deal with the same issues that, that every other citizen does. You know, they have family problems, they have personal problems, and sometimes that bleed over is tough. 
Uh, if you remove personnel issues out of the, the world of law enforcement, man, it'd be a great place. But, um, you know, that's, cops, that's the truth. Cops went into the spotlight. <laughs> um, when? when? When did cops hit? And I mean, George Floyd is one thing, but beyond that, when did cops get into the negative light? Uh, you know, I would say when Obama was elected. Uh, okay. It was shortly after Obama was elected. I, I think you remember there was an issue on a Harvard campus, I believe. Oh, yeah. College campus. And, the break-in. And, yeah. yeah. And Obama made the comment that the police acted stupidly. Yeah. And uh, the narrative about law enforcement it became very, very ugly. I mean, you know, there'd always been mistakes. Yeah. Cops are human. They're yeah. going to make mistakes. But it became highlighted by the president at that point. That and was the beer summit. At, yes, yeah. 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 He spent eight years with Obama in office just routinely talk, criticizing and talking about how negative law enforcement was. And, and you know, I, I grew up poor, dirt poor. Yeah, I know. My, my experience You're a with, Texas kid for people to don't yeah, know that. And my experience with law enforcement was way different. They were yeah. heroes in my home. Yeah. Uh, you know, we had a we had a messed up uh, home life yeah. <laughs> when the cops came in that was a good thing you oh, know yeah. so yeah. to hear those narratives uh, that were coming from the president of the United States that was yeah. tough yeah. Um, and it's it's taken a long time to I, I guess try to recover from that Trump was great in supporting law yes, enforcement um, again one of the reasons why I thought he was an excellent president uh, law and order was front and center uh, but we're right back in that same mix with uh, Biden in office. Sure. Uh, law enforcement's the enemy again. Why do you think the Democrats win? Um, boy, I don't know. I, 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 I think they have a unified team in a lot of ways. They may not they may not agree with their candidate, but they'll align behind their candidate. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't they don't throw eggs at their no. at their at their own candidates. They get behind them. They understand the importance of winning versus being in control. Mm -hmm. um, y y you can't. You can't be in control unless you win. And you've had Ted Trump on, and several yeah. others have. And Brilliant guys. Yeah, you yeah. know, he and I probably disagree on most everything under the sun, but he's right. You it's know, brilliant. Democrats want to win, Republicans want to prove they're right. And well, those yeah. two things don't always align. I always say that, that you know, the, the, certainly the Democratic Party has its share, fair share of crazies. Sure. But they find a way to go, go, go sit down. They give them something to do. Yeah. And when we win, we'll bring in, you can't rule unless you win. That's a hundred percent. And the Republican Party crazies are the mad dogs out front, and not attacking the Democrats, but attacking fellow Republicans. Yeah, I, you know, in the time that I've been in office, you know, obviously I've I've angered both sides of the aisle. Um, then you know you're doing it right. Yeah, you know, I, I I'm not going to be perfect for everybody, no. but I've been criticized more by the people in my own party than I've I'm ever sure. been by Democrats. There's not really a Republican or a Democrat way to enforce the law. No, my opinion. Sometimes, um, you know, I'll put it out there about certain issues, but I get criticized more from Republicans than by Democrats. So last week I've been told Mark this, Casper's here, and we take a picture together. He puts it on his Facebook page. <laughs> it's like they attack him for having sure. a picture of me, and my, I got my arm around him, you know, and I'm going like, I, I always, personally, because I don't care. Sure. But you go back to Nietzsche, I always use Nietzsche, don't tell me who likes you. I won't know who you are. Tell me who doesn't like you, right. and then I will know who you are. So I'm looking at this picture of Casper and all the people that are hating Casper because he took a picture. Right. Man, I thought, how absurd. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. silly. You know, I guess the difference between, say, me and Casper is I, I worked in a jail for several years. Oh, yeah. I've been called everything <laughs> under the oh, sun. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, I've had to interact with people who most yeah. definitely didn't want to interact with no. me. And like, do I, talk radio for yeah. a number of, you know, like you fill in the blank. Yeah. You know. Thick skin. I, you yeah. know, it is what it is. I, I get elected to do a job. I do the job the best I know how. Uh, I, I say what I think's right. And if people don't agree with it, they'll elect someone else. What's the best part about being sheriff? Oh, man. So it. It's not, it's not being public, it's none of that stuff. The best part about being the sheriff or being in law enforcement period is catching that person that thinks they got away with it. Yeah. That person who's victimized <laughs> someone, you know, they're five or six months down the road or even five minutes down the road and you catch them, hold them accountable, you restore the victim as best you can. There's nothing better than that, it's priceless. And I, that's what drives most cops to keep doing yeah. the job they do because it certainly isn't the pay, it certainly isn't the hours, it's not the benefits, oh. it's that reward of making a victim whole. Favorite story is giving you an example of what you just talked about. Oh man, I've got a bunch of them. Please. But, um, yeah, so, a, a tragic story, we had a, um, a lady in Gilcrest, Colorado who was murdered in her own home. Um, it was a, a, a case where probably should, shouldn't have been solved uh, by all accounts. A uh, stranger comes to the door, 
Um, this lady, out of the goodness of her heart, invites the guy in. He says he's there to try to clean up her property. Um, she turns her back and he murders her um, in a very brutal way. I was just new into the investigations unit of our agency and, um, you know, young kid trying to cut his teeth and the investigation had kind of stalled out and me and another gal uh, got assigned to take over lead of the investigation due to some personnel issues. So we start leading the case and I'd been a gumshoe cop, you know, working mm -hmm. burglaries, that kind of stuff. And I said, well, we know what evidence we have. Let's follow the evidence. Um, so we ended up working this homicide basically like a burglary. Started looking, could we find the stuff that this guy took out of the house? Lo and behold, within about, um, about 36 hours, we had identified a suspect, got him, got him into our office, um, had to interview him twice, uh, but finally got a confession out of the guy and um, go on and talking to that family. And, you know, we couldn't bring their, their grandma back. We couldn't bring mom back, but satisfying what had happened and closing a door, that was probably the most rewarding case I've ever worked. Do you find, and one of the things that's always intrigued me, writing cop stories or having listening to police talk, that they, and I've heard them say this, they come across a certain kind of a person. Oh, sure. You know what I'm going to ask. Yeah. There's pure evil in the world. Yeah. 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 And, you know, that's the part that when you go down to the legislature and you testify against a bill and um, or testify for a bill and they talk about these people having mental illness and <clears> addiction <throat> and, and, yeah, all those things so exist. true, sure. Yeah. But you take a person who's just evil and you add that stuff yeah. on top of it, if you remove all that stuff away, they're still evil. And you have to figure out a way to deal with evil. Mm -hmm. And I, a lot of people in our society don't understand that evil exists. Mm -hmm. People who wear a uniform get it. What I'm afraid of now that um, this legislative body is in place now and who's been elected to Congress, right. is they're going to bring heroin meth injection back. <laughs> well, and I'm serious as a heart attack. I mean, I, 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 had, I was mentioning Dean last yeah. night. Dean and I were talking about it. And... Um, the man who's behind all of this right now, Mark Crowley, myself, and Stefan, we went up there. Yeah, I remember you, you guys sure. reporting on it. It's a vision of hell. Yeah. And Albus Brooks said, oh, you could put one of those next to my house. I've been up there. And uh, I went. You know, I, I had a really tough conversation with a, a good friend of mine. We were talking about mm -hmm. fentanyl and heroin and all oh. that kind of stuff. And, you know, you talk about heroin mm -hmm. injection sites. I'm not sure that that wouldn't almost be a, a, a plus from where we're at right now with fentanyl. Um, they have fentanyl machines now. I yeah, mean, I right. mean, the level of addiction that is uh, existing in our communities right now is is disturbing. But mm -hmm. if you open that door, you're opening the door to open drug use for everything. And whether it's heroin injection, fentanyl use, whatever it may be, uh, we, we have a problem. I, as an amateur history reader, this is what the, the British did it to the Chinese. Yep. They allowed yeah. and they addicted and then they maintained and controlled an, an, a country. And they did it with opium. Which yeah, I, I look at it and say, okay, what's the what's the positive outcome that comes from this for anyone? And it's hard to identify. It's you okay know? to kill yourself on the installment plan. Yeah, help yourself. I, but I don't know how anyone who who looks at this and says, yeah, it's an addiction, it's a problem. I don't know how they can walk out on the street and say this is okay. You know, that mm -hmm. person is in a good place. You watch some guy, some junkie on the street that's you know living in their clothes, yeah. there has to be a better way for that person. And sometimes the best way to clean that person up is to take them to jail. Oh yeah. And I can tell you that from years oh, of experience. Yeah. Yeah, I have friends that- Taking that person to jail and saying, this is, your, this is it, this is rock bottom for you. Let's clean you up, let's get you sober and take them away from that yeah. experience. And sometimes it doesn't work on the first time or the 10th oh, time, yeah. I just but it does work. I found out over the Christmas break, I had, have, a relative living on the streets in Denver. This is a true story. Sure. 51 years old. He is my cousin's son. And we work nonstop with Steph and everybody. He's in New Beginnings right now. First time he's going to sobriety in his life, and uh, or into sobriety in his life. And um, my cousin lives in California, sure. called me. It was like long lost. Do you remember me? Uh, kind of. Well, my, yeah. <laughs> but what I watched was this, this man is now in to begin his rehabilitation. Sure. Now, let's hope it works. Yeah, and, and you know, there are programs out there, and, and yeah. when you talk about STEP, that's one of the few, oh. right? But 
how many of those programs exist around the state? How, what's their capacity? There's just not well, one. And oftentimes the capacity in a community is law enforcement and it is a jail. But if you take that away, it's there's nothing. There's is there, nothing. There's homeless. Is there homeless gone into Weld County? Now? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Pete, there's nowhere in the state. I, I, I go all over the place. Um, you know, I've been asked to go speak at stuff, and, and it's an awesome opportunity. But I get a chance to see parts of the state. And everywhere I've gone, I mean, it doesn't matter the size of the community, you see it now. So what's the answer? And that wasn't there when we were kids that we're talking about. I grew up near railroad tracks that were kind of behind my dad's house. Sure. And we'd see guys jump off and run, and, and they were called hobos. They were called all kinds of different right. things. But we didn't see what we're seeing now. Maybe, maybe in the Great American Depression, they were called Hoovervilles. Sure. Not like now. I, you know, I don't know exactly what that answer is, but I can tell you if what we're doing now isn't working, we shouldn't keep doing it. There we you should go. add more of it. There you, you know, go. You, you go back 10 years, we didn't have a lot no. of the problems we have now. And people no. argue, oh, well, the population's different. No. The addiction's different. No. No, the process is different. That's right. what we've changed. That's exactly right. It, you know, you look at how many folks are sitting in prison right now on drug cases. There's not a lot. There really aren't. No. But that's the narrative that the legislators will tell you is that oh, all these folks are locked up for drug addiction. They're locked up for crimes often that they committed to support their drug addiction, but clean up this mess and, and hold people accountable for their actions, and oftentimes they stop. I've often told the story. I would go with the late Bob Cote because Step had a relationship in jails that if you weren't a sex criminal, a violent criminal, mm -hmm. you could come. And I'd be in a room with Bob and just sitting there watching. And he'd say, how many people are in here because I of do that all the time. getting yep. high, trying to get money to get high, on a high? Yep. And, and, and the other one that he would ask is, um, how many of you know your dads? Right. I mean, he would ask these, do you know your fathers? Um, yeah. How many can read and write? I mean, he would do that. And I would yeah. say, oh, my God. But then Bob would say, you can come to step and do your time. Three out of five, I want to go back to jail. Mm -hmm. It's easier. Well, so I, I do that a little differently. Yeah. So, you know, you have kids that grow up in an education system that doesn't really teach them reality. And so anytime a kid reaches out to our agency and says, hey, I've got a high school project I need to do or a college kid, okay, you know, and I'll bring them over to the jail and try to guide them down a pathway where they start interacting with these inmates. And female inmates are the best because they tend to be the least guarded. Tell the truth, yeah. Yeah, so you bring them in. And I remember bringing an 18-year-old girl, a uh, family friend of ours, brought mm -hmm. this 18-year-old girl in so she could interview uh, a handful of inmates. She ends up in interviewing 16, 16 18 inmates. Mm -hmm. And each one of them, she asked them, what was the root cause of why they were there? It, almost every one of them. I can't say every one of them. Almost every one of them. It was a drug addiction. <laughs> yeah. And then the, the follow-up question, are you better off here than you were before you got arrested? And every one of them said yes. If I gave you a magic wand, Final question. What three things would you change right now? Um, well, I, I'd put penalties back on drugs. Um, I mean, that's that's an obvious one for me. Um, I would create what they call a truth in sentencing or what you've often heard truth in sentencing. People need to know what the consequences for their actions are. Victims need to know what the consequences are for a person that, that, um, that does something against them. And then the last thing is just change the narrative for uh, for what law enforcement does in the state of Colorado. Um, they need to be supported again. Uh, it, they should not be the villains. But they are. They are, but that has to change. I mean, the, the, has to the diminishment of the rank and file guys that are friends, we ride motorcycles together, yep. the guys I met through MC1 for these many, many years of MC1 and all that kind of stuff. They're just, you know, guys like me and you, mm -hmm. and certainly like you. and. Um, and they hurt when people say stuff. You, I mean, I know they hurt. You're damn right. Um, you know, I, I watch. I watch when news feeds come mm -hmm. through, and when you get one of those national narratives about how bad law enforcement mm -hmm. performed, uh, you see it in the faces of the guys coming oh. in the. And you know, even you take the the murders that recently happened in Idaho, and how the media was. Oh. Uh, they were portraying this this police department to have done such terrible work. And they were I, on them. And, yeah, I, I, I sat on the couch with my wife, and I said, you know. Th this is going to turn, and those guys are going to look like they really knew what they were doing. And lo and behold, guess what? They did. Did you see anybody say we're sorry? Nope, not Tell a one. Huh? Huh? But huh? that's the that's the issue that has to stop is just assuming that cops are automatically uh, doing things wrong or they're all evil intended. Because I haven't met very many of those folks. There's so much media now, so much. Um, 
I mean, I know you listen to the radio show, and that always makes me happy because we're in the middle of a radio show, and say I'll get a text from the sheriff. <laughs> but uh, critique the media. What do you see, Colorado Front Range Media? Um, you know, I th you can look at any talk radio show. You can mm -hmm. look at, at any uh, news station. And it, it still a lot of times goes to the, the idea if it, if it bleeds, it leads. Always. And the difference is now we almost, a, a lot of them, the news stations have an, a, a built-in defense for the suspect. Mm -hmm. And, oh, we have a, you know, a murder that happened in Denver. Mm -hmm. You know, let's hope the police investigate it right. Let's hope the police don't shoot wow. an innocent person. I've seen that happen. And, and it's, it's disturbing because it, it covers up the root problem, right? It, 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 I have to take my glasses off to do this. Watch certain news anchors in Denver, and they'll read a story about the cops, and they'll say, Let's, and then they give the eye raise. Yeah. <laughs> and it's as though <laughs> they're saying to you facially, yes. you know, they're the cops. Get it? You well, know? take the, you know, the shooting that happened in downtown Denver. You know, yeah. you have a cop that's being charged right now for reckless endangerment and whatnot. We've totally blown past the fact oh. that some suspect down there was Busting. brandishing a gun sure. and, you know, scaring the hell out of people. It's the cops that are the right. problem. And yeah. they messed up. That, you know, that cop may have messed yeah. up, but he did not want to be there on his own. No. That cop didn't ask to be invited to that incident. And I'm not defending a cop who, who, who makes a bad shoot, but he had, shouldn't have had to shoot anyways. Shouldn't have had to be there. And they'll live off of it. Yep. Sheriff Reams, everybody. Um, I know it perhaps is too soon to say, but then you get term limited. <laughs> <laughs> and you're a young man. I mean, you're tough as nails. I, we, I talked about, um, I went to Jeff's retirement, Jeff Schrader's, who I'm going to get in here, and Spurlock's out now, and, you know, the old guards moving up. Right. Do, you, do you think about that moment? Do you think about, okay, that's enough of this? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, I had my retirement calculator on. Uh, as soon as I <laughs> so, got elected. So did Jeff. I said, Jeff, all right, he'd go, 11, and he yeah. just he knew so what I he got was a lot. Of, I yeah. still have a long ways yeah. to go, but, yeah. um, you know, when I got reelected to my third term, I'm like, okay, well, we know where the end is. Um, and I have good people coming up behind me. I, I think I've done good for my agency. I'm confident oh. that whomever takes over is getting an agency that's in better shape than, than when I mm -hmm. took it over. And that's no knock against my predecessor. Mm -hmm. um, I'm leaving it better than I found it. And I think we'll have good people that come up behind um, and, and take the reins. But it, yeah, it's bittersweet. Um, you know, I, lo I, love the <clears throat> I love the career I do. It'll be 29 years when it's all said wow. and done. And um, I'll have to figure out what I want to be when I grow up. I wanted to put this in the back of your head as we wrap this up. Um, this summer, um, True Hour, who's a retired Major General, um, <laughs> Kenny Deal, who you know. I know where this is going. I, yeah. No, no, listen to this. <laughs> We're plotting this. Yes, sir. Uh, I have never been to the Custer Battlefield or the Little Bighorn, the Greasy Grass. You, you bet. We're going. All right. Going on motorcycles. We're going to go to Montana and see it. I'll see it for the first sure. time. And then we're going to ride into Sturgis. Well, you know how much I like I love to ride. I'll be in Sturgis for sure. The, you just have to make sure you go to Sturgis on the same week as I do. I promise we'll, we'll be there together. I <laughs> promise. Bet. And you so bet. we're gonna we're gonna do. And I so we're talking about it. We're planning it. And I said I'm gonna invite Reams. I'm in. I'm in. And we'll go to Montana. And then we'll cut across. We'll be on the bikes for. I don't know. I've, last year we went. We I never went. I've I've never been there. Yeah. And so we're we're plotting it. So I'm all in. It, it's it's oh, done. There's nothing like riding a bike. Down the hall, Saturday morning at 9 o'clock, the most recent drop of documents in the Kennedy assassination. And there are a couple of women historians that live in Texas that I have a friendship with. One of the most bizarre things is the audio of a phone call. And Lee Harvey Oswald's in Mexico. He's calling the Soviet embassy, and he wants to go back to Odessa less than two months after, or before, rather, John Kennedy's murdered. Why is he asking him to go back to Odessa when he's plotting to kill Jack Kennedy? And so we will relive a lot of that new, the, the um, I should relive, relive part of it, but look at all the new stuff that's dropped. Take care of yourself. This is a good man. Mark, thank you very much. This is The Shoot. See you on Saturday at 9.